What's going on y'all, it's Javon.ca and we are here again for another episode of 100 Ways to Make 100K, the show where we're on the hunt to find 100 different ways to make 100 grand a month. Now I'm honored to be at the founder's house here sitting with none other than Dimitri Gretschko, founder of Descree and a bunch of other agencies that he once exited. And on this episode, we're gonna dive into the way that he made 100 grand for the first time in a year, in a month, and in a day. Was it in a day? Like one day. <laughs> <laughs> one day well dimitri thanks so much man we're so excited to dive a little bit into your story so maybe you could add a little bit of context about who it is that you are maybe you could introduce yourself to the guests and uh share a little bit about your background you know before we dive into the details yeah absolutely so my name is dimitri i was born and raised in ukraine i came to canada uh 10 years ago actually with my wife that i know since kindergarten and my small brother who was I think it was 12 or 13 when we initially came here. Uh, yeah, three of us. Your wife that you've known since kindergarten? Yeah. <laughs> you guys you guys known each other since kindergarten? Yeah. Did you get married before or, or after? When <laughs> yeah. We actually got married in Canada. Okay. Because I am I was very slow in that process, I would say. Okay, it took your time. So you moved yeah. her here and then you said, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. That's fine. <laughs> it's, it's real now. <laughs> yeah, awesome. and we've been to the same um, elementary school, high school, university, like basically the whole time together. Wow. So when you when you first got here, you know, what were some of your first moves? I'm curious, like right when you get to Canada, you know, brand new immigrant, you know, what was it like? What was that experience like? Uh, I actually like I came here almost by mistake, actually. By mistake? Yeah. Well, oh, you, you don't want to hang out with us. Hey, OK, all right. Yeah. <laughs> I, it's, it's funny because like when I was in Ukraine, spent a year uh, there in National Aviation University. And then I'm like, okay, I just want to go out explore. Did you say world. National Aviation University? Yeah. So you were studying to be a pilot or something? Uh, most aviation engineering. Yeah. Okay. Aviation engineering. Yeah. Okay. Keep going. So essentially, yeah, like I was okay. I want to go out and explore. So I I was accepted to Harvard at one point, but uh, it was quite expensive mm. to be able to to move uh, down there and. Then I got an invite from Canada from one of our universities. Wow. And I'm like, okay, like, let's go out and see. And I came here first time to see it in February. I was impressed by how welcoming the blizzard was, let's say. <laughs> and yeah, like, and yeah, we decided to move here. And I, in August 2013, we just came here. I came here just to study. Mm. I went to York University. Mm. And yeah. yeah, do you remember? So let's fast forward. What ended up happening? So you, you didn't study aviation engineering no. at York. What did you end up studying? Uh, I was marketing. It was actually because of my one of my professors. I wanted to study finance. Okay. But there was one professor. His name is Charles Hendricks. And he essentially told me what is what the marketing is, is actually is. Okay. And I think that made me in one, like first lecture, I'm like, okay, I got to go study marketing. Hmm. And so what is it, you know, according to Mr. Professor Hendricks? Yeah, he, he was the one to tell me that the marketing is not the art of convincing people to buy something, but it's the art of making people want to buy something. Wow. And yeah, I think that was, that was the biggest thing that clicked in my brain at that time. And yeah. That's why, like, after university, first thing I started doing was marketing agents. Yeah, and is that the first time you made 100 grand in a year? Uh, no, first one, no. Like, first one was tough. First agency was difficult. I think the second one was that. Okay, and you mean the second agency? Yes. Yeah, How agency. many agencies did you do in total for the audience? I think there was three or four. Okay, so let's dive in. What was the first one? So the first agency that we built was technically, yeah, we were just offering, you know, websites small marketing services like paid ads and things like that yeah, yeah which was fun because you start out you like i've never opened up a business before anything like that and that was a fun way of doing things mm -hmm. but uh <clears throat> we quickly realized that like if you go out there and try to sell something without knowing what's un your unique value what mm -hmm. are you selling it's very hard to make a sale okay and i think we couldn't figure out what was unique about what we were doing at that time so we pivoted and we started doing different types of agencies. Right? So, so you said, you know, we're not going to do this agency anymore. We're going to do another agency. Yeah, because we, man, like first agency we did, I was like, okay, how we're going to close clients? We're like, okay, let's work with restaurants. So what we did. Everybody's. We, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> man, we basically did, uh, we went to all the restaurants from uh, Young and Steel's all the way down to Young and Englinton. Okay. Went to every single one. Just door right. knocking, trying to sell websites. Okay. 
Yeah, and I think we closed like four or five or something like that. All right, all right, there and, you go. Yeah. And that, that, was, that was probably the best four or five deals you ever got. You're like, yeah. oh, let's go, we're in business. A lot Miners. of walking, yeah. And yeah. it was funny that afterwards, my second agencies, okay, uh, there was a few clients, restaurant clients that came into those without remembering me trying to knock to their doors and convince them. I'm like, so, so what changed? So the first agency, you're knocking, you're, you're going door to door, you're trying to s sell these restaurants, let them know that they need a website. Yeah. And you know, you said you didn't know your value proposition, but now all of a sudden you switch to a new agency and these guys are coming to you now. Yeah. So what, what was your original value? What made you realize that you didn't have any value? And then what made you change to your new value? Yeah, I would say the trick was that we've been trying to sell what, which is like, hey, you need a website. And they're like, I don't need a website, why? Mm. And instead of selling websites, we started selling a, there's a new way for you to communicate with your customers. Okay. And website is one of those ways. Okay. And then what we started doing after that, we started going deeper and we, we helped them like automate some part of their business practices and things mm. like that. And that was the second agency that I've done, but that was essentially, that was still small because we tried to sell to a small, very small market, right? Not small volume wise, it's a huge market, mm -hmm. but we've been going after the wrong type of customer. In a sense. I mean, Young and Steel is Young and Eglinton. Yeah. Some would argue it's a huge market, it's massive. <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's the service. Like yeah. we realized that what we've been doing very good is okay. we figure out how, how to create like a proper like automation flow within the company, how you can leverage technology be able to work more efficiently. And so what did that automation flow look like, for example, in the form of a restaurant? Yeah, with the restaurants, initially that was, you know, something from, uh, we, we started working with, instead of working small restaurants, we started working with the bigger guys, oh, right? Okay. So we realized that what we've been good at is building, let's say, if you wanna, if you wanna automate the way you do your financials, your marketing flow, and many, many other things, restaurants, don't necessarily do that at that scale. So went mm -hmm. to more mid-market companies. Okay. So we started working with different manufacturing companies, uh, logistic companies, procurement, aviation actually as well. Okay. And with them, we started developing like pretty much enterprise software for them. Wow. Yeah. So that was everything from like R&D projects. We we're developing like computer vision projects for like quotation systems. Holy smokes. Yeah, bunch of very like interesting, like high tech projects. And I think that was the transition for us from like, hey, we're building simple websites mm -hmm. to like, hey, we're making innov innovation accessible wow. to the companies that otherwise couldn't like, don't have the internal capabilities of doing that. Wow, that's so, interesting. And this was agency number two. That was the third one. Actually. This was agency number three. Yeah. Okay. Was the third so, one. which one was the first one that you made a hundred grand in a year from? That was yeah. That was that was the second one. That was the second one, and that was kind of like the up upscale or up market restaurants a little bit, right? Yeah, kind, kind it, of sort of kind of like yeah. We I think we in terms of like agencies per se, like we mm -hmm. since I had like multiple at the same time, right? Yeah. It was hard. Like it's. <clears throat> Instead of uh, <clears throat> switching the, so let's say instead of within the same agency, start working with a completely different clientele, we just open up a new one, right? Got it. And for example, where the name Deskry was coming from originally, because the first the first business that I opened here wasn't actually an agency. It was a startup that I did with my smaller brother. With? With my smaller brother. Okay. Yeah. So he came to me. I remember that very vividly because I was reading books about startups and entrepreneurship and all about Google, Apple. And my, and my brother, he was 14. He comes to me and says, hey, why you read all your books? And you sit in your ass and you don't do anything. Why? Jeez. And I think hearing that from a 14-year-old, like, click something. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay, let's do a startup together. Yeah. And had no idea what to do whatsoever. We just opened up a company. Wow. And we're trying to come up with a name for it. And he came up with the word desk read. At that time, why the word came from is we're trying to build a software for people to organize their learning process. Okay. And for us, that like when you're doing something, that comes from three things. It's yeah, you learn, you create something, and you collaborate with others. Okay. So the motto for us was learn, create, collaborate. And we imagine that as three desks where people would sit when you're learning, creating, or collaborating. Okay. So that's where the word desk read came from initially. Which is kind of like what's happening right behind us right now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's cool. And uh, we kept the word desk read for 
you know, for the agency after that, we go yeah. to Deskry Studio. And the main product that we are, the startup I'm working on right now, it's also called Deskry. It's a legacy from the name that my brother came up with. Yeah, and is your brother still involved? Uh, in the desk screen, no, but we're actually working on two other projects with him. Okay, okay. Well, we'll keep that under wraps unless you want to uh, expose and, and give a little bit of a teaser. Uh, we're building up a, actually, we're building up a resort. Okay, in, a uh, resort. Yeah. Wow. In, uh, yeah, in... The new market. <laughs> no, yeah, I wish, like, I, if if there was accessible land, i okay. say, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it's going to be up north. It's going to be, like, cool. Grand Horse Muskoka region. Yeah. Very cool, very cool. We're excited to watch that come to life. Now, do you remember the first time you made a hundred grand in a month? Yeah, that was the agency. Yeah, that was this, the third agency. The, so the third agency now, what, so this is like the, the software that isn't accessible, sorry, yeah. the software that isn't accessible for like, kind yeah. of like mid-tier companies. It's basically, stuff like that. for example, let's say you are a um, manufacturing company, right? Yeah, yeah. So a very good example of that would be there was a company that was uh, working with mineries a lot with my with like mining yeah okay. exactly and they needed to have a way to basically create quotations for their clients okay right? so instead of going down there or let's like say to the actual states, mine. yeah exactly they were able to build an app for them where somebody somebody in the mine itself could go in with an app and just essentially like show using the software create necessary pictures and everything that will be analyzed and then the company would receive that data and they can create a quotation without flying somebody down there. Wow. Yeah, so things like that. So mm -hmm. that's what I mean by innovation in a sense where the company would come to us with a problem mm -hmm. saying, hey, this is the business problem that we have. And mm -hmm. we were able to apply the technology to be able to solve this as a problem. Now, how old were you at the time? Oh, that was... Like roughly. I was 23. You're, so you're 23 years old. Yeah. You're speaking with a Ukrainian accent. Yeah. In, in a native English speaking country. Yeah. Now you're convincing these big, big time business owners and decision makers at companies that you're going to create this app for them to solve all their business problems. Now, how do you even get an opportunity or get into a room like that to share with them and them share their problems with you? Mm -hmm. Right. There's so many people that don't even know a room exists, number one, but you happen to get into the room over and over and over again. And position yourself in a way that you're a 23 year old expert in a room where these guys have been doing that thing for years and don't even know how, like, how do you do that? That's a great question, actually, because I think part of that was I was blind enough not to be afraid in a sense. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I remember the first time we did it was when we went to a room with a guy who made like a lot of money, he's a pretty famous guy. And we showed him how we could hack his system within uh, 30 seconds. And you hacked it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so we showed him that and how that he didn't give us a contract we wished for initially, but mm -hmm. that was a foot in the door. We started doing that. Yeah. So what did you do? You called him and said, hey, I could hack your system in 30 seconds. Let me show you something. We got, we essentially, we heard that from uh, from a friend, we heard that they're building something. Okay. And we looked at it like, oh, like that's, that's actually not good. And there's oh, problems really? with this. Okay. And we just booked a meeting with a guy. We reached out, hey, like, we would love like 20 minutes of your time mm -hmm. went in we show him the problem and yeah that's how that's how we got it wow and and so what how did that foot in the door end up turning to you know an opportunity later so yeah we it, it, it we essentially became the go-to company for them to wow. do everything like digital essentially wow that's cool so is that like the strategy or like okay who else can we hack next or what nah. did you just kind of like hang out with this one company for a while and start growing actually like 99 percent of all the agency clients we close after that have been referral wow. so what happened the first two agency would build portfolio smaller companies right mm -hmm. but they had friends of so friends of friends of friends okay like one uh one restaurant we've been working with like they knew a guy i think from from ibm or cisco if i'm not mistaken was lead engineer there mm -hmm. and he's like oh like i know another guy who needs some help with this mm -hmm. and that was referrals okay so we never actually we tried advertising the agency or whatever it never worked yeah yeah and even we we spent hundreds of thousands of dollars trying to hire salespeople huh. to go out and sell and and that also like for lead gen for example yeah that did not didn't end up working for us as well so every sale we've ever done almost i think maybe except for one or two have been referrals 
Hmm, that's crazy. So now you get to this point where you want to leave this company. Why did you even want to leave? I I realized one thing is that it's not always um, when the company comes with you with a problem, right? Yeah. And they generally want to have a solution. This is a perfect type of a client because you can work with them. They trust your expertise mm -hmm. and you build something with them. Quite often what happens is the company not only comes with the problem, they come up with their own solution and they're telling you, I want that to be done exactly this way. Mm. And there are two things that are going to happen. Either you're able to convince them that your way of doing this, this is the right way because you've done this before and so on. Or if you just take it and build whatever they tell you to build, at the end of the day, the product, it's either not going to work with the customers or they're not going to like it themselves. And that's going to turn on you at the end of the day. Mm. We learned hard just once. And after that, we had a policy that if that's the case, we're just not working. Mm. That's all. Interesting. So how did you get out of that company? So I know a lot of people end up just saying, you know what, I'm closing down this company. Their clients are left to go find something else. They're, going, they're left to go find some other service provider. They still have needs that are unmet, but you're like, I'm not doing this anymore. Mm -hmm. So what did, what did, how did you like leave that and, you know, then start something new? Yeah, it was, it was actually by accident because at some point I grew tired of building products for somebody else. Okay. And that dream that I started with my smaller brother of building a startup. Yeah. Because startups, I think they're like really in a good and in a bad way, overly glorified. Okay. As an industry, because you want to be the next, uh, like Zuck. Elon Musk or yeah. Zuck or whatever. You want to build some cool stuff. And I had my own like startup superheroes, actually. There, there have been two of them. Uh, one was Vlad. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. Okay. <laughs> one was Vlad Magdalene. He's the founder of Webflow. Okay. Which, and the second one was Ryan Holmes, founder of Hootsuite. And funny enough, both of them ended up being investor in my startup right now. Wow. But uh, what I'm saying that startups are really glorified is that a lot of people are talking about how cool it is to raise money and everything but not a lot of people are talking about what it actually is, what you need to go through to get there. And I always wanted to build a startup because I haven't seen the other part of the story. Mm. And then, but I also knew that I don't want to build a startup for the sake of doing so. And I'm only going to do it if I see an opportunity that I want to take. Mm -hmm. And at some point that opportunity presented itself, because yeah. what happened is we develop a software within the agency mm -hmm. because what the software was doing is we realized at some point that our biggest uh, biggest expense was back-end development. So okay. if you're creating a software, there's two components. The front-end is what you as a user see when you interact with an app or a web app. And the back-end is all the databases, servers, the logic, and all the heavy lifting per se. Mm -hmm. And that was the most expensive item for us to always do because we had to keep people who know different cloud providers, mm -hmm. different types of, you know, different types of backend, like security, API development, and so on. Okay. And we decided to do a system for us to be able to automate it, mm. just to save money as an agency. That, okay. was, that was all. And this is what you did in the third ag in agency number three? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and we call them agency one, two, and three, because they've all been called desk, yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> so the, yeah, and we built that software. And okay. essentially, and then what happened, we used it for a year, year and a half. Mm -hmm. And then our clients started reaching out to us and saying, hey, I've seen that you guys built it using this tool. Like, you can actually use the tool instead of paying for your service. Wow. Initially, like first few months, I got it wrong way. I'm like, oh, we have a service problem. Mm -hmm. And I realized only, I think, three or four months after, like, hey, it's not a service problem. It's actually a product opportunity. Okay. And at that point, when I realized that, I just came to my wife and I said, like, look, I'm about to do something stupid right now, most likely. But... I'm about to do something stupid. That's yeah. how you started the conversation. Yeah. What did you think? What do you think was going through your mind after you said that? Like, I said, man, it's hard to discuss. We just got our first kid. Yeah. Right? And I come to my wife and I'm saying, like, hey, we're doing very good on the agency side. Yeah. But I'm thinking of shutting down the agency, firing all the clients. And how, you... how, how well were you doing? You said we're doing pretty good. Like, how well, roughly? Like, I would say that uh, if not, okay, there are two types of well. Like, for us... A well was right before COVID, right? Okay, okay. But in March of 2020, when it all started, we lost like just in one month, a few million dollars in revenue. Okay. Because essentially many of the companies that we started working with or was about to start working with, they were going bankrupt, shutting down, cutting yeah. the budgets. Yeah. So that was a tough, 
uh, point in time. Mm -hmm. But we actually started working, conceptualizing the product right before the COVID. Okay. Right? So yeah, and I basically came to her and I said, look, like, you know, we just want to fire all the clients. Wow. We want to reduce the team size to just a few people. And I'm thinking about building a product out of it. Wow. Yeah. And, and what was her response? Sure. She said, sure. <laughs> was she involved in the company at all? Or uh, she was just like, your cheer like, what's her role? What's your wife's role throughout all of this? Is she on the team? Is she a cheerleader? Is she your main support system? Like, how's, how's your guys' relationship throughout this startup phase? Because I know a lot of startup founders are, are you know, single. They're, they're going out all the time, right? It seems like you've got a solid support system. Like, you came here with your wife and your brother, and it seems like they're still rocking with you. My, I would say my wife is something that keeps me moving forward. And that's been like that since the inception. Okay. Tell me an interesting it's JK. Track. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like, cause yeah. we, like I, so when I was a kid, like I still, still am, but mm -hmm. when I was a kid, I got a very rare tumor. Okay. And my, we started dating with my wife, uh, three days before, actually two days before my first surgery. Mm. and she's been with me through all of that wow. and that's been tough because i like i spent like across like 10 or 12 surgeries i like yeah spent a lot of time in the hospital let's say we lived in different cities at that time so we went through all of that so after that startup seems like you know vacation yeah at least it seemed at the beginning <laughs> yeah 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 Wow. So she is definitely a support, mm -hmm. but support not in a passive way. Support in a way where, uh, yeah, I don't like. I would never imagine being able to handle all of that without her. Yeah. Wow. Shout out your wife. What's her name? Yulia. Yulia. Yeah. Shout out Yulia, man. <laughs> Holding it down. So you mentioned you had these two startup heroes. Yeah. One being the founder of Webflow. One being the founder of Hootsuite. What about these characters? Why were, why were they your heroes? Like, what did they, what, what about them stuck out to you? Uh, I was reading a lot about Vlad from Webflow when, uh, of how he got, how he started bu building Webflow and what he went through to be able to do that in a sense where a lot of times when you read about startup stories, people get an impression like, oh, you know, you went from nothing to everything like in two years, right? But in reality, if you look at a lot of companies like Webflow, take a lot of time, like five, 10, seven years to get to something. And Vlad's story, why it struck me was the fact that he went together with his wife, he went through a lot of things on the financial side as well. And that just, yeah, that was very close to my story, how it was starting out as well. And yeah, that's something that inspired me for a long time. Wow. What about Plus they built an awesome product. Yeah, yeah. What about Hootsuite? Hootsuite, Ryan Holmes, to me, I think, he was, first of all, like I consider him to be the first like big name startup in, in Canada period, right? Okay. But from the second standpoint, like he, he is someone who's very brave in the way he approached the, the marketing and the naming of, of Hootsuite and like the Hootsuite bus that they've done in, in streets of Vancouver and the whole you know, the energy around the startup that he was able to build, like that was super inspiring because I heard the first time I heard about Hootsuite mm -hmm. was from a course about marketing that I took on, I think it was Udacity or something like that. Yeah. And yeah, and then I just started to read about Hootsuite's story. I'm like, wow, this is, he, yeah, he definitely got the energy okay. to do that. Now, how, how are you taking lessons from these heroes and applying them to your everyday these days? You know, into the, into the, it sounds like culture, into the personal story. And then a couple, I, I don't want to call them failures, right? Because they were pretty necessary in order to get to where you are. Mm -hmm. But agency one, agency two, agency three, what, Webflow founder, Hootsuite founder, how are you taking, and what key lessons from each of these are you taking as you build Descri in today's form? Uh, I would say, especially from a lot from, uh, from Webflow, the biggest lesson that, that I learned is that there is no such thing as, you know, a miracle, let's say, right? Because yeah. when people talk, especially about Webflow grows, they think, oh, it just happened overnight, right? Something, something happened, some sort of miracle, and then the entire thing exploded. And I, I, myself as well, I thought about it the same way. I always thought that, oh, like 
tools like Figma, Slack, all of them just exploded for some reason. Mm -hmm. And what is that reason why they exploded? Mm -hmm. And I think when I had an opportunity to talk to people like that, that was my first thing to try to understand what was where the explosion came from. Mm -hmm. And I think one thing I realized is that there was no explosion. It's just a lot of hard work throughout all the years. And then once you make it big, people are like, oh, you're here, right? They suddenly, mm -hmm. they suddenly realize you're here and they're like, oh, it happened overnight. No, the person has been working for five, seven, 10 years yeah. to make it happen so that people think it is explosion. Yeah, wow. I would say that, yeah, that's, that's the biggest lesson. And from Ryan, I think personally, what I learned from him was the fact that um, if, you, if you're working on something, don't let it consume your, your in, entire self. Mm -hmm. in a sense where you're still a human being mm -hmm. you still have a body that you need to maintain mm -hmm. you still have a peace of mind that you need to maintain mm -hmm. and if you fail to maintain those essential items for you to function mm -hmm. you're not going to be able to build what you're trying to build okay and that's i think that's some that's a lesson still digesting yeah and trying to implement but it's an extremely valuable one. yeah i feel like that's one that's going to be a, a constant dance and evolution from now so I guess the end, right? Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. And what about from agency number three? You know, what do you think the biggest lesson from that one was? Uh, it's, I think it was more of a, I would say two things. One was the feeling that not being scared to do things because mm -hmm. initially before you start a business, it feels like there's things that are unreachable to you. Yeah. Like talking to the guys that make a lot of money yeah. or big companies, yeah. like, how do I do it? And I think that feeling got washed away, which was great. Mm -hmm. And the second thing is the skill was like how to build software because mm. my background was not in software engineering at all. Yeah, it was, it was aviation engineering and then marketing, right? Yeah. And <laughs> I, I remember like when we started, started with my brother, we essentially we hired two engineers uh, here and trying to make it work. Mm -hmm. And uh, we got, we lent some money from my dad to build a startup and so on. Mm -hmm. And then I realized, okay, like I, if I want to be able to build something, I got to have a skill to be able to do it on my own, mm -hmm. right? If I, let's say I don't have any money, yeah. but if I have that skill, I want to do it. Yeah, I want to be able to make something out of nothing. Exactly. And I think the first point I realized what it was when, me and my brother were sitting, I'm like, we got to find software developers. Mm -hmm. And and we're like, where where do we find them? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay, well, peop, software engineers go to hackathons. Let's go to hackathon. He's like, but to get into hackathon, you need to be an engineer. I'm like, exactly. So, <laughs> so you're going to study engineering. No, <laughs> basically, like, man, we, we, we found a hackathon. It was called Hack the Norse. Okay. It's one of the biggest in Canada, if not the biggest. Mm -hmm. And the guy who organized it that year, his name is Vinod Kosova, which is founder of Kosova Ventures, one of the biggest venture funds there is. Mm -hmm. And that hackathon had an interesting thing. They had mentioned that we're looking for people who know rare pro programming languages. And I'm like, okay. So I decided to learn Fortran and Cabal, which is like one of the first programming languages ever to exist. Okay. And that was weeks. the first one that you said. You said, all right, screw it. I'm doing the, yeah. the most rare one. Yeah. This is the criteria. Okay. Exactly. And right. I'm like, okay, if you guys, that's the way you out. I'm like, okay. Good, let's do it. So right. <laughs> I learned them in a couple of weeks and I managed to get in. Funny enough, again, it was my first tr time trying in engineering. Yeah. All my friends were in engineering school. They did not get in. Mm. And I was the one learning that for two weeks and I got in. Wow. So what I was doing, I was trying to find engineers to work mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. with me and so on. And I had a chance to speak with uh, Vinod Kaswa. And I told him like, hey, like I basically hacked my way into hackathon. Mm -hmm. And he's like, man, this is cool. This is admirable. But if you truly want to build something, you got to have an engineering mindset. It's not about the skill, but it's about the mindset of how to build things. Wow. And that was another moment when, again, something clicked. Yeah. And that's how I started learning. And, and so what is that engineering mindset? Now that you start to know engineering, if you were going to talk to a marketing guy, yeah. you know, and what's the difference between the thinking? I would say is an ability to solve problems, right? So what marketers can't solve problems? They can, but uh, in a sense where marketers, marketing is a one way of solving something, right? Okay. Engineering is about finding ways of solving something. Interesting. So to me, give me an example. 
uh let's say if we actually uh we didn't close like we fired a lot of clients not fired clients per se let me paraphrase so we, we actually broke up with clients <laughs> yeah we, we essentially we had a lot of situation where a client would come into us and they would say hey uh -huh. i'm trying to build this app mm -hmm. and because i'm trying to solve this problem mm -hmm. and we'll come to him and say hey look you actually don't need an app Mm. to be able to solve this problem there's other ways of doing that mm -hmm. maybe it's through marketing maybe it's through something else yeah yeah but like it is not an answer to that okay so yeah and i would say that that engineering mindset and skill mm -hmm. that's something that helped me out later on because when we started building desk as a platform as a startup yeah 90 like percent of the initial code base i wrote myself yeah. Huh. And with that super rare language or one of the more modern no, ones? No, like the proper ones. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. So, how, how did you start learning code? Was it just YouTube University? Uh, that was funnier than that. We essentially we had two engineers, we, we, we hired them, and they're like, hey, we're back end guys. We don't have a front end. Mm -hmm. I'm like, what's front end? <laughs> like, well, that's this. Yeah. I'm like, okay. And I'm like, what language is that? They're like, well, it's JavaScript. I'm like, okay. And I essentially Google and I started playing with that just in, I didn't watch, I, I didn't think I watched any videos or anything. I was just reading things. Okay. And yeah, and I, I was tasked like, hey, you got to build the front end from that, for that. And I started building it out. Initially it was garbage mm -hmm. and then. Just got better over time. Yeah. That's cool. That's, so now you went from, uh, you know, self-funded, right? agency world yeah and all of a sudden you transition over to startup world where it's fundraising yes right what are some of the differences between each of them you know because i mean there's some people that would fundraise and be like oh yeah we just got a million dollars in one conversation and boom a million dollars in a day right there there's a bunch of stuff that goes into it obviously but the whole thought process behind that versus like client services there's a difference tell me about some of the differences between them because i don't raise money i don't you know it's not really something that i'm akin to and i'm just yeah. like okay why would i raise money i could go sell something right but what's the thought process behind that because you went from one mm -hmm. to another yeah um uh, i think that one of the most important thing for me because when we started startup with my brother yeah we uh were reading a lot about like y combinator okay and many other things, the big name funds and so on. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of like a big dream because I get was reading about Webflow, yeah. secured money from Excel, and we I knew all those names. Mm -hmm. And when I started working with Startup, I'm like, okay, I'm gonna do exactly that. Mm -hmm. And what I realized was for me, raising money was kind of a milestone, right? Really? Yeah, because you get that first round, you start working with those big guys yeah. and that feeling. And I think this is the the thing that is very wrong about this as approach because at the end of the day, once you got the money, mm -hmm. it's nothing changes per se. Okay. Is you're still he here to make product. You're still here to make something that people would be not just buying from you, but would love to live by, right? Mm. And money is just an instrument for you to be able to to do it. But regardless of the name of the fund or the people behind or anything, at the end of the day, they're not going to solve your problems. Mm. They can help you. They can connect you with other people and so on. But by the end of the day, it doesn't you're, you have to build the, the product. Yeah. And when we started fundraising, that was, I think, still to this, one of the toughest things that I've done initially. How come? How come? Uh, we started, first of all, in the most horrible time possible. Okay. Because usually you fundraise, there's windows when you do it. Okay. One is from uh, September to November. Okay. Why September? Because there is a Burning Man. There is a, oh, the Burning Man. Yeah. Okay. Once VCs go out of Burning Man, there's a lot of empathy. There's a lot of, <laughs> sorry? Empathy. Okay. Let's say. Um, there's a cool book about it. It's called um, Stealing Fire. Uh, but, uh, yeah, and it, it basically ends in November when there's a US Thanksgiving. Yeah. And after between November and January, mid-January, there was nothing. When we started raising our first round, second part of November. Mm. So, and I was essentially, I was trying to reach out to funds, nobody responding to anything. And then I met a guy, uh, his name is Kyle. He's founder of CTO.ai. He was the one who initially helped me make sense of what fundraising is 
and that was he was one of the most instrumental people for me the, the beginning what did he teach you he told me look because uh, i reached out i'm like hey kyle like because we met in lisbon before okay and i'm like and he has a very cool startup and i reached out to him he gave me some of his time and he's like well how much money you have left in the company i'm like well we have two months we have too much or two months two months oh okay yeah we i'm like we have basically two to three months of money left yeah uh including so crunch time so you're worried like you're yeah you're, yeah what's going through your head around this time in your kind of like just day to day like when you're not working because this must be nervous you're like shit i'm yeah I'm running thin right now this shirt's getting tight you know <laughs> initially because when we you see we we heard a lot that oh you can close around based on the idea or okay. like you can do it fast and in my head that was like okay i can close around in two weeks so i have yeah. two money uh, two months it's it's For a lot of time yeah two months is enough to party why don't you close this in no time yeah and then when we reached out to kyle he said look you actually need to have around six months to be able to do it i'm like how come six months everybody's yeah. saying they can raise an idea he was like, well, not really. Like, unless you, you know, done the startup before you know the space, you know yeah. the people. Yeah. Like, yeah, you can do it. Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. if it's your first time, Good you got to <laughs> warm up the relationship. You're going to find the people. Yeah. They're going to know you. It's not going to be that fast. Mm -hmm. And that was very tough to realize. Mm -hmm. Like, right before the Christmas, I was like, geez, like, we're in trouble. Wow. So when we came out of a year in January, that was January 2022. Mm -hmm. Um um we came out and i'm like okay i'm gonna message every single fund that i can find so and what are you doing just googling and emailing cold yeah. email okay i was basically buying like their emails the partners emails wow lists and yeah, stuff yeah and i i messaged i think close to i think it was 1700 people or something like that you, okay so you sent 1700 email yeah okay so you and you bought this so so you're already on two months then and you're like fuck it i'm gonna buy it like i'm just gonna buy the list screw it yeah no it was mostly most like we were trying to source the list and paying 10 bucks there for free trial to get a part of them yeah like yeah that. <laughs> and, and then, then using the hacking skills to try and you know mm -hmm. yeah, okay yeah and man like we started and i started messaging and then like a few people respond everybody not, not out of 1700 how many would you say like responded i think maybe 100 max so you got 100 out of 1700 yeah okay and then 70 percent of them were like hey no i'm interested so okay so out of that you got maybe what 30 meetings yeah okay so 1700 emails to get 30 meetings yeah and then and then we started getting meetings initial meetings were not great mm -hmm, right mm -hmm. because people were like because i didn't know how to behave because now <laughs> so, now I such a funny statement i didn't know what i was doing yeah i didn't know how to behave you yeah. pitch and then you're like you, you told them your story and everything mm -hmm. and you don't know what to, what to expect after you yeah. don't know whether they need to think about it, do mm -hmm. you wait a week or two? Like, what Maybe do you do? You ready to go right now? Like, what's the deal? Like, how do we, where do we go from here? Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> and that was like, that was very awkward. Yeah. Right. And then. Yeah, you've been married to the same girl since junior kindergarten. You never asked these people on a date before. Yeah. This is the first time. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And, and that was, that was a trick. And uh, then what started happening is um everything became more and more difficult we now have not two months we have like two month. weeks oh shoot. and what happens is then in um in february the war in ukraine starts mm. and my wife's uh parents they're in donetsk where uh, the epicenter of that is yeah yeah my parents uh they just left ukraine but all my friends were in ukraine wow and i was like watching the the videos of how the whole thing unfolds messy and sorry about that man. yeah it was it was tough and mm -hmm. then i was watching that like till 7 a.m yeah and next day on like that day at 9 a.m we had a meeting with forum ventures in, okay in the office we're sitting right now okay and jonah from forum uh and i was contemplating like do i take this meeting or not because I didn't look good like at all yeah you're up all night you've been stressing for the last what six weeks at this point yeah yeah and uh we took the meeting and 20 minutes into that like jonah said like hey i would like to offer you I would, like i would like to invest i'm like okay cool mm -hmm. and then i i think it took me half a day to actually process the fact that he said yes yeah because you didn't know what the hell happens next you're like yeah, yeah. you're so used to like people not even answering that you don't even know where to go from here right exactly yeah. and and then 
like plus like the whole the, the war thing and so on. and i'm like what like what's what happened what do like what, yeah. what's going on what does this mean i'm i still haven't slept <laughs> yeah and yeah. jonah from like he he is the one who not only like he was the first yes mm -hmm. but he was the one to help me make sense out of the whole thing wow because not only like yes like we got a part of forum accelerator mm -hmm. and they became an investor and during this time he was the one who told me like to help me understand the, what's going on in the head of investor when you talk to them okay. and what the process looks like. What are the rules of the game in yeah. a sense? Okay. And yeah, after that, we, uh, uh, we signed another fund called Hustle Fund. Uh, they're amazing people to work with. Mm -hmm. And this is, I would say this is one of the coolest funds to come over Silicon Valley. What right makes now. them cool? Like what makes a fund cool? Yeah. You know? It's, I would say... In my mind, it's just a bank account with someone <laughs> saying yes or no, right? Like, what makes a fund so cool? I would say a few things. Like, was, it's people. Okay. Initially, I was hunting the wrong thing. I was going after the names. Uh, like Sequoia, Excel, like, big name fund. Well, and, I thought you were just going after the names that you could buy on the list. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. But you aim at the top, right? Yeah, You're like, yeah. oh, like, it's a trillion dollar fund or whatever. Okay. And... uh and I, Jonah was the one to help me realize the fund name does not mean as much as the people, as the partners that you work with in okay. that fund. Okay. So with Hustle Fund, thing was that the not it's not about them helping us like navigate the VC environment, mm -hmm. but helping us realize that we are a part of like the fact that we're located in Canada does not separate us from startups in San Francisco or in mm -hmm. New York, right? Mm -hmm. Because up until then, we feel like kind of like separated in a sense. Yeah. And that was a cool thing about them. And then we signed with a third investor, which is Alex Norman. Okay. He's founder of N49P Ventures, but he was also founder of Tectio. Okay. Which is Tectio, it's interesting story because I've been to the very first Tectio that I ever started. Wow. And I, not only that, but we try to hunt the developers by going to Tectio. Okay. And yeah, like I've been to so many Tectio events. Yeah. And, I'm, and I always look at Alex because he was the quietest person in the room. And to me, who's always the quietest, to me, those are the smartest people in the room. And I was like, okay, I, I want to talk to Alex at some point. Mm -hmm. And then when I learned that he has a fund, I'm like, mm -hmm. okay, I, 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 he got to be an investor. Mm -hmm. And yeah, he was the one to join us in the first round that we've, we've secured. Wow yeah so um, what were some of the things that jonah you said his name was yeah you know he you mentioned he taught you the lay of the land and a little bit about what to expect when speaking with um with vcs yeah you know and what it's like on the other side of the table what were some of those remarkable things that you'd say that he taught you or some of the key takeaways that ended up helping you on your future conversations that you ended up having with other investors mm. Jonah has a very interesting phrase, and that is very true. He said it a few times. He said that being Canadian, we're tr uh, like Canadian people try to be very pragmatic. Okay. But VCs are not pragmatic people. These are people that try to invest in the future. Mm -hmm. And if you're trying to sell them the present, you won't be able to get the money from people who want to buy the future. Huh. So that was, I think, a big thing for me to realize because I was trying to... So wrong thing, I would say initially. Okay. What were you, okay. Well, keep going. Yeah. I'm curious though. And the second thing is also like how the process works in general, because the fact that you, for example, if you want to talk to a fund, not all the fund accept cold outreach per se. Oh. Right. So if you go from the streets, it's inaccessible. That's why those people never responded to me, those 1700. Okay. Because I was not introduced by someone. You're an outsider. Yeah. You got to yeah. be introduced by a, another founder mm -hmm. within their portfolio mm -hmm. or another investor that they know of so that they trust the introduction so they can trust you. Okay. And it's interesting. So there's so many funds that never responded to me. And then when we raised the money initially, they reached out like, oh, we've seen that you fundraised from them before. I'm like, yeah, like I sent you like 20 emails before. <laughs> you haven't seen those. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. And the whole, like, it's, it's not even about that. It's mostly like how, how you should follow up with them, right? Okay. Timing of that. So okay. you should talk to this many funds in this period of time to get them close instead of trying to extend the, 
uh, fundraising process and definitely you basically mm -hmm. select a time frame window okay. where you fundraise. So for example, you'll put like a deadline on it. Yeah. Okay. To generate that FOMO, like fear of miss missing out in mm -hmm. a sense where you say like, hey guys. We're closing our round this date. Yeah. We're talking to 60 other funds or 100 mm -hmm. other funds mm -hmm. and you know, where you stand on that. So that because funds, when they don't sense that there there is a timetable for all of that yeah they can pr extend that process indefinitely okay right so it's one of those tricks and i think so one of the most very well structured content on like how to actually do it actually comes from uh, eric uh founder of hustle fund okay so he has a very interesting youtube channel okay. where they teach people like they showcase even little tricks how you fundraise on zoom and yeah, things like yeah. that Huh, yeah. that's interesting. So you mentioned uh, selling the present to people who are trying to invest in the future. Yes. What were you trying to sell and how did it change after learning that? Uh, what we tried to sell is we showing people, hey, we have this many users at this point. We build that. We have mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. Buy it from us. Invest in us. Mm -hmm. And instead, we, what startups should be selling is like, this is what we're changing. This is what we're improving. This is where we want to be. Huh. And that is where we are going to be in five or seven years from now. Wow. And that's why you should invest in it. And can you paint that picture for us now? Yeah, I'd absolutely. love to hear where Deskry will be in the future, right? Because this is essentially how you're going to, this is the plan. Like, where are we making 100, 100K a day? How are we yeah. changing the lives of the businesses that are, you know, buying our software, right? Buying this product that was birthed from the pain that you felt of serving uh, your clients as an agency owner. Yeah, I would say the main thing we're changing is the paradigm of the fact that you need to have very skilled engineers and a lot of them to build high quality products mm. on the back end. What our platform actually allows people to do is to be able to build like enterprise grade cloud infrastructure, essentially in minutes versus spending months or years doing that with a large engineering team. Mm -hmm. So we want to make the, that level of you know, backend and cloud or APIs accessible to small development teams. That's wow. that's where we're going after. Wow, Dimitro, thanks for uh, giving us a glimpse <laughs> into the life, man. So I'm curious, like, why why are you working so hard? Wow, that's a that's a that's a good question. Mm, initially, initially, I thought that I'm doing that for myself because I I want to build it. I want to be in that position. I I want to do it. And the more I do it, the more I realize that I'm not doing that for myself is like, for example, that tough time where we were run out of money and we couldn't fundraise. Uh, the reason why I kept going was because of my daughter, because I, I remember one day, like I was losing that. It was difficult. I was, I was sitting, I was basically paralyzed. I couldn't move because I was so stressed. Mm -hmm. And I look at her, I think she was like two. And I look at her and I'm like, okay, like, if I'm if I'm not gonna do it, like like I, I gotta do it. If not for myself, for her, like she's gonna have it. And I want to make sure that when she goes to school or when she grows up, I can be an example that mm -hmm. she can live by. Mm -hmm. So there is that component, but there is also a component because it's an interesting thing to do. What I realized the reason why I switched from an agency into a startup was that I stop finding agencies to be something interesting. Mm. But what we're doing now is I'm genuinely excited. Like I, I can wake up despite how hard it is. I wake up and I, I'm like, I actually want to do it. Mm -hmm. And that feeling is, is great. Yeah. hundred percent. Well, we appreciate you sharing with us a uh, little bit of your story up to the chapter that we're <laughs> on now. I'm sure, yeah. you know, if I come, if I come check it three months, six months, a year from now, It'll, uh, it'll take a couple new turns and twists and who knows where it'll end up. Like, uh, who was it that said it? I think Steve Jobs or the best is yet to come. Yeah. So that concludes any, any final words, anything that you want to share with the, I mean, damn, if, let me see. Cause a lot of this stuff that I create is for my little brother as well. Right mm -hmm. now, if you were to disappear, right. And all your work, all, all of it left, right. And you could say one last message to your little brother, work related, obviously building related, because like you'll be able to see him again. But if you had, if you were going to get wiped off the earth and everything you created were to get wiped off the earth and you could leave one message for your little brother, what would it be? Hmm. 
I would say that that would be the fact that there is nothing different between you and the people that you think that have done that. Mm. There's nothing that should be stopping you from attempting and succeeding in mm. doing so. And yeah, just pursue what you love. That's that's the main thing. Yeah, one hundred percent, man. Well, thank you so much. We're, thank we're you. honored to have you on the show. Uh, we'll include. Wait, we're, just let us know where we can find you. Absolutely. You just yeah, just go to deskree dot com. Yeah, d e s k r e e dot com. Yeah. yeah. All yeah. right, beauty. Well, You'll thanks so me. much for tuning in to another. And where can they find you personally? LinkedIn. LinkedIn. Yeah. Dimitro Gretschko. Yeah. Done. The rest is history. Well, thanks so much for tuning in to another episode of 100 Ways to Make 100K. I'm your host, Javon.ca, and this is the show where we're on the hunt to find 100 different ways to make 100 grand in a month. Dimitro, thanks so much for sharing. That's yours. Thank you. Thank you for having me. See you on the next episode. Peace.